hospitals are rolled out in an equitable way to rural areas as well as more urban ones. We now come to the urgent question, but I'll let the front benches clear. We now come to the urgent question. I call the Shadow Secretary of State, David Lammy. Yeah. To ask the Secretary of State if he'll make a statement on the situation in Gaza and Israel. Minister. Uh, can I uh, thank uh, the Honourable Gentleman for his urgent question? Uh, Mr. Speaker, Israel suffered the worst terrorist attack in its history on the 7th of October last year. The scenes we saw on that day were appalling, and Hamas's disregard for civilian welfare continues today, over five months later. We remember uh, those all the time still being held hostage and their families, and we call once again for their immediate release. However, we of course remain deeply concerned about the humanitarian situation in Gaza and the impact of the conflict on all Palestinian civilians. We have borne witness, Mr Speaker, to death and displacement on a vast scale. Over 1,700,000 people have had, the, had to leave their homes, many on multiple occasions. We are deeply concerned about the growing risk of famine, exacerbated by the spread of disease and, of course, the terrible psycho psychosocial impacts of the conflict that will be felt for years to come. We are totally committed to getting humanitarian aid to all the people in Gaza who desperately need it, either ourselves or through UN agencies and British or other charities. We and our partners are pushing to get aid in through all feasible means, by land, sea and air. We have trebled our aid funding to the OPTs this year, Mr Speaker, providing just under £100 million, of which £70 million has been delivered as humanitarian assistance. 150 tonnes more of UK aid arrived in Gaza on the 13th of March, including 840 family tents, 13,440 blankets, almost 3,000 shelter kits and shelter fixing kits, 6,000 sleeping mats and more than 3,000 dignity kits. A field hospital provided by UK aid funding to UK Med arrived in Gaza from Manchester last Friday. This facility, staffed by UK and local medics, will be able to treat over 100 patients a day. Along with Cyprus, the US, UAE and others, Britain will help deliver humanitarian aid by sea to a new temporary US military pier in Gaza via a maritime corridor from Cyprus. But we have been clear that air and sea deliveries cannot substitute delivery of aid through land routes. Only through land routes can the volume of aid now be required to be met. We continue to press Israel to open more land crossings for longer and with fewer screening requirements. There is no doubt that land crossings are the most effective means of getting aid into Gaza, and Israel must do more. There is also no doubt that the best way to bring an end to the suffering is to agree an immediate humanitarian pause and progress towards a sustainable permanent ceasefire without a return to destruction, fighting and loss of life. Getting to this outcome is the focus of all our diplomatic efforts right now, Mr Speaker, and a goal that is shared by our international partners. We urge all sides to seize the opportunity and continue negotiations to reach an agreement as soon as possible. David Lammy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday, a UN BAT report revealed the shocking reality that famine in Gaza is imminent. Half the population is expected to face catastrophic levels of hunger, the highest number of people ever recorded under this system. Only twice in 20 years have famine conditions been reached. But what distinguishes the horror in Gaza from what has come before is that this is not driven by drought or natural disaster. It is man-made. 
It is the consequences of war. It is the consequence of aid that is available not reaching those who need it. Food is piled up in trucks just a few kilometres away, while children in Gaza are starving. It's unbearable, and it must not go on. <coughs> International law is clear. Israel has an obligation to ensure the provision of aid. The binding measures ordered by the ICJ require this. The world has demanded it for months, yet still aid flows are woefully inadequate. Mm -hmm. Aid actually fell by half between, February and, uh, between January and February. This is outrageous. The continued restrictions on aid flows are completely unacceptable. It must stop now, just as Hamas must release the hostages now. I don't doubt that the Minister agrees with me, but will he have the courage to say that the ICJ's orders, including on aid, are binding? Yes. and that Israel must comply with them? And does the FCDO's lawyers believe Israel is in compliance currently with its obligations? Amid this accelerating hunger crisis, Prime Minister Netanyahu reportedly approved plans for an offensive against Rafa. This would risk catastrophic humanitarian consequences. It would be a disaster for civilians and a strategic mistake. How is the government working to prevent a further attack on Rafa? The truth is this. If it isn't possible to address the crisis in Gaza, uh, it won't be possible to address the crisis in Gaza if the fighting doesn't stop. And that is also the best way to secure the release of hostages. So will the government finally now join with us and dozens of countries and call for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his uh, questions and his comments, and let me try and deal with them uh, more or less sequentially. Uh, first of all, he asked me about the reports of famine, and the IPC report uh, is clear. It says, and I quote, famine is a very real scenario. And we are doing everything we can, as I set out in my first response, to try and head that off. There is also, in addition to famine, the danger of disease, the lack of health services, the acute danger from the lack of clean water and effective uh, sanitation. So, so we are doing everything we can to head off the appalling circumstances which he set out. He asks me also about the number of trucks. Uh, I can tell him that on Sunday 192 trucks did get in, but that is woefully short of what is required. It is more than got in in March, which averaged 165 so far, and in February it was only 1997. But he will be well aware that before the crisis, uh, more than 500 trucks a day were getting in. He asked me about uh, the ICJ. As everyone in the House will know, the ICJ uh, judgment is binding. Uh, and in respect of the offensive against Rafa, the Foreign Secretary and the Prime Minister, uh, and indeed all our allies, have consistently warned that an offensive against Rafa at this time would have the most appalling humanitarian uh, uh, con uh, consequences. Uh, so uh, may I finish by taking the point that he made again about a ceasefire. As far as I'm aware, the position of the Labour front bench is still the same as the position of the government, that we are calling for, we are calling for an immediate pause so that we can get the hostages out. So, so, Mr Speaker, that we can get the hostages out and aid in, followed, we hope, by a sustainable ceasefire. And it is that, Mr Speaker, that we are working towards. Yeah. Chair of the Select Committee, Alicia Khan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I start by putting on record my gratitude for the Minister for Middle East, who made significant representations ahead of Ramadan to reduce tensions in Jerusalem and particular access to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which so far remains calm. The IPC report does make breathtakingly difficult reading, and the humanitarian situation is catastrophic. 
but it need not be. So can I ask that we please push harder on the Jordan land truck entry and make sure that is fully operationalised? And can my right honourable friend tell me when the House will be formally updated on whether Israel is demonstrating commitment to international humanitarian law? Well, I thank her for her uh, comments. And I will pass on her comments about my colleague, uh, Lord Ahmed, uh, the Minister for the uh, Middle East. In respect of international humanitarian law, we are going through the necessary legal processes, which are complex. But I can tell her that as soon as we are in a position to update the House on what we have set out clearly before, uh, we will do so. Spokesperson Brendan O'Hara. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I take absolutely no satisfaction in saying that a month ago in this chamber I said that innocent people will die because of Israel's decision to prevent food getting to those who need it. So these reports of an imminent famine should surprise no one. We have all known that this deliberate man-made famine was coming. I have just returned from Al Arish on the Egyptian Gaza border with the Foreign Affairs Committee, where we saw hundreds and hundreds of lorry loads of food and aid waiting for permission to get into Gaza. So let us be very clear about our language here. The people of Gaza are not starving. The people of Gaza are being starved. And does the Minister accept that there is no food shortage in the region? Does he accept that the reason that people are starving to death just 44 miles from Tel Aviv, the distance between Glasgow and Edinburgh, is as a direct result of the Israeli siege and the premeditated decision yep. to cut off food supplies? Yep. And does he also accept that starving a civilian population to death is a war crime? Yep. And finally, does he still believe that the UK is right, both legally and morally? to continue set selling weapons to Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, on his uh, final point, Mr Speaker, he is well aware of the arms sale regime that Britain adopts. And uh, as I have said to him uh, before, from this dispatch box, it is the toughest uh, anywhere in the world. I think, Mr Speaker, I think, Mr. Speaker the, 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 the difference, if I may say so, between him and me is that uh, as we, he sees things as we would wish them to be, but uh, we in government have to deal with them as they are. And that is why we are taking so many steps to try and achieve the release of the hostages and to get aid and support uh, into uh, Gaza. And, and to, one, to one point that uh, he makes where he is right, and it's a point also echoed by the Shadow Foreign Secretary. And it is this. The way to get aid into Gaza is by road and by truck. Of course, we are doing everything we can to explore every way, including the maritime route and dropping aid, and dropping aid from the air. But at the end of the day, it is through road traffic, and that's one of the reasons why we are uh, working so closely with Jordan to ensure that that route of aid in by road is enhanced. But at the end of the day, it, that is the right route to get aid in, and we are doing everything we can to try and make sure that it is pursued. Shrola Bahil. time, I, I asked my right honourable friend about progress on trying to uh, have a hostage transfer, because right at the core of mm. this is the visceral feeling, which I think anyone can understand, of Israelis that they want their people home. Mm -hmm. uh, has, has any progress been made, and would you like to just update the House on, on where point. we are with that? Good question. Well, I completely agree with my right honourable and learned friend, and, and that is why trying to get the hostages uh, home and out of Gaza and trying to get food in. These are our two twin absolute objectives. And in an extremely difficult circumstance, Britain is certainly right at the front of uh, trying to, of all countries, uh, trying to achieve that. It would not be sensible, Mr Speaker, for me to give the House a sort of running commentary on hostage release, but he will have seen that negotiations have resumed in Qatar, and obviously uh, everyone in the House will hope that those negotiations are both speedy and successful. Richard Bergen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <coughs> A new independent multi-agency investigation by the UN into an Israeli military airstrike 
on a residential compound housing an emergency medical team, including from Medical Aid for Palestinians, a UK charity, has found it most likely involved in a thousand-pound US manufactured bomb fired from an F-16 jet. F-16s include parts supplied by the UK. So will the Minister today rule out conclusively that no parts supplied by the UK were used to bomb a compound housing medical staff from a UK charity? Minister. Yeah. 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 Well, the, the events that the Honourable Gentleman describes are appalling, and what the British Government would say is there must be a full and transparent uh, inquiry and examination into how those events took place. Andrew Percy. Speaker, it remains incredible that some people in this place can barely utter a word of criticism of the Hamas regime in Gaza, who themselves are being accused of stealing and hoarding aid. In terms of the operation in Rafa, the Israeli government is very clear that hostages are being held there, that some of those hostages are being subjected to sexual violence and to other abuse. Are we saying to the Israeli government that they have no right to go in to seek to rescue those hostages or not? Minister. No, my, as my honourable friend knows, we have been absolutely clear throughout that Israel has the right of self defence, and what he is describing is covered by the right of self defence. And my honourable friend sets out eloquently the absolute blame for what has happened, the events on October the 7th perpetrated by Hamas, and once again he is absolutely right in making that context. Leila Brown. Speaker, we're talking as if famine is imminent, but the fact is that the UN reports 27 Palestinian children have already died from starvation and hunger. Joseph Burrell said that hunger shouldn't be used as a weapon of war, and I would hope the Minister would agree with him. We need that ceasefire immediately. We need it to get the hostages out, we need it to get aid in, and we need it to get all the killing to stop. My question to the Minister is simple. What we're doing isn't working, but there is one more thing we can do, which is to change how we vote at the Security Council. Will the UK stop abstaining and join the rest of the world in calling for that immediate ceasefire now. Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, she, she speaks on these matters with both great knowledge and great sincerity, and I greatly respect uh, what she says. The problem, the problem with calling uh, for an immediate ceasefire is it may solve our consciences, but it is not deliverable because neither side in this, appall in this appalling brutality, neither side is willing to embrace a ceasefire. And that is why the policy of the British government is to argue in every way we can for a pause so that we can get the hostages out and get aid in, which can then lead to a sustainable ceasefire. And that is what we will continue to do, both, as she says, in all international fora, including at the United Nations. Kit Boltos. Mr Speaker, uh, over the last few months we've all listened to the Minister um, uh, explaining that the government has been begging, pleading, pressing uh, the Israeli government to allow more aid in to seemingly little effect. So now, has he reached the conclusion that the Israeli government is willfully obstructing the entrance of aid into the Gaza Strip? And if so, that will presumably be a breach of the International Court of Justice's ruling and indeed international humanitarian law. So what will the consequence be of that conclusion? Minister. Well, I don't, I don't agree with his premise, because I don't think we are in a position to reach that uh, judgment. But the point that he is making is that it is essential to get more food and aid and support and medicines into Gaza. And every day the British government is working intensely to that end. Beth Winter. Famine is currently a reality, the highest hunger level of anywhere else in the world in terms of total numbers, all human made, and a ceasefire is a requirement. Those are the words of the UN General Secretary and Matthew Hollingsworth, uh, the Director of the World Food Programme uh, country, and starvation is indeed being used as a weapon of war. Mr Speaker, in Gaza it is clear that Israel is engineering a famine of over two million civilians. And it is also clear UK diplomacy has failed. 
So the Minister must now indicate what action the Government is going to take to escalate pressure to stop Israel's military assault, demand a ceasefire and ensure that emergency assistance is provided through UNRWA to those being starved to death. Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I think many people in Israel and elsewhere will find part of what she said profoundly offensive. And, and the, point, the point I would make to her is that she is right that the, the characteristics of famine are present in Gaza, as I set out in my earlier response. And that is why we are doing everything we can, together with our allies, to get as much food and support into Gaza as we possibly can. Sir Mike Mr Speaker, officials on the ground have stated that Hamas is appropriating or misappropriating as much as 60 per cent of the humanitarian aid that is entering the Gaza Strip. And this is part of a long pattern of prioritising fighters, abusing aid to produce rockets and using construction materials to build hundreds of miles of tunnels for its terror activities. So we know they do it, they've done it for years and they're doing it now. Does my right honourable friend share my concern that Hamas is flagrantly disregarding the humanitarian needs of the people of Gaza whilst Israel has been increasing the amount of aid going in exponentially? Minister. Well, I very much agree with my right honourable and learned friend that Hamas is using ordinary people in Gaza as a human shield. It is utterly repugnant, as well as completely against international humanitarian law. And like him, I condemn it. Foreign Session Lomi. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Humanitarian organisations have been warning repeatedly that this would happen. A group of us met with them last week. When this conflict started, I met with Islamic Relief, who are based in my constituency. We have now ended up here, where we are seeing health care being attacked, systematically being degraded. We are seeing no safe zones left. We are told that famine is on the onset, and we are told that the number of people being killed keeps rising. Will the Minister finally please Listen to the calls of members across this House, the international communities, the people working on the ground, and call for an immediate ceasefire and unrestricted aid. Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I have set out uh, several times already today why calling for an immediate ceasefire may make us feel better, but is not, is not, is not, is not, a, is not a practical resolution. And that is why there is no difference between the analysis that she makes and the NGOs in her constituency and mine. There is no difference between the analysis. The question is, what do we do about it? And that is why Britain, along with our allies, is continuously on a 24-7 uh, basis arguing and doing everything practical we can to get more food and support into Gaza. David Jones. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend has mentioned the floating pier to be constructed by the United States. Uh, what uh, assurances has he received that that pier will be used solely for the delivery of humanitarian aid and not, as has been suggested, subsequently repurposed for military use? Minister. Well, I think uh, it, is, it is early days yet to see precisely how that a maritime initiative will deliver. But uh, what he fears, I do not believe, will be allowed to happen in the way in which uh, we, we tackle that issue. And we are giving strong support to all mechanisms for getting aid into Gaza, air, uh, sea and land. But he, like me, will understand that the best mechanism is always by land. Janet Chirk. Speaker, I don't think I've ever received as many emails of concern from my Edinburgh South West constituents as I have about the situation in Gaza. And as has already been said, over half a million Palestinians are at starvation levels. 27 children and three adults have died so far as a result of starvation and dehydration. And in the words of Medical Aid for Palestine, this is not happening because the rains have failed or because there has been a poor harvest. Mm -hmm. It's happening because the Israeli authorities have refused to allow enough food into Gaza. So I have this question for him, and my Edinburgh South West constituents will be listening to the answer. Does he agree that starvation as a weapon of war is a war crime? Mr. Well, the, the, the point which I hope that she will make to her Edinburgh constituents 
is that she and I, the government, the whole House, is intent on ensuring that more food and more support gets into Gaza as rapidly as uh, possible. And that is uh, what the government is doing every day. Neil O'Brien. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I really welcome the hard work that the Minister is doing to get more aid in, to bring an end to the fighting and to get the hostages uh, released. But it is just appalling to think that large numbers of innocent people, including children, are about to starve when there's aid just over the border. He is right that the aid must flow across the borders. It's better to get it by trucks. But if that's not possible, we must think of this like the Berlin airlift. We've got to get aid in via the sea, via airdrops. I welcome what the Americans are doing to drop it along the shore. We've just got to do whatever it takes to get the aid to the kids who are going to starve unless we do it. Minister. Well, I, I, I completely agree with the sentiments that he expresses uh, so profoundly. And uh, that he is right that every single mechanism must be explored. But he will know that in terms of tonnage, the amount that you can drop from the air, the dangers to those underneath, uh, the dangers of the aid then being misappropriated and stolen by Hamas, these are very real uh, difficulties. And also he will be fully aware about the difficulties of the maritime entry. And that is why we are doing everything we can to argue for more points of entry into Gaza, more trucks to get in there and more different land routes to get the aid which, as he so rightly says, is desperately needed in. Imran Jose. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The ICJ's interim ruling made it absolutely clear the killing of Palestinians in Gaza must stop, but it hasn't. Immediate humanitarian aid must be allowed into Gaza, but it hasn't. And the safety and security of civilians must be guaranteed, but it hasn't. As a result, we are now seeing more than a million Palestinians in Gaza left starving and on the brink of famine, as confirmed by the IPC report today. And the Israeli government continues to flout international law now through the use of starvation as a weapon of war. So I ask the Minister, whilst the children are left starving, civilians are killed and medical facilities attacked, just what will it take for the government to stand with international humanitarian law and oppose the actions of the Israeli military? And how many more innocent Palestinians must be massacred? How many more children must die uh, uh, through starvation? And when will they call for an immediate ceasefire? Well, Mr Speaker, I, I would have hoped that the one thing that was missing from uh, what he said then was an urgent call for the release of the hostages. Uh, and uh, and, and what, what, I, what, I, what I say to him, what I, what I say to him, Mr Speaker, in, in answer to his question, is that Israel must do more. And we've set out very clearly the five steps that Israel needs to take. They are an immediate humanitarian pause, increased capacity for aid distribution inside Gaza, increased humanitarian access through land and maritime routes, expanding the types of humanitarian assistance allowed into Gaza, such as shelter and items critical for infrastructure repair, and fifthly, a resumption of electricity, water and telecommunication services. Now, I hope that both he and I can unite with everyone else in this House on going after those five key aims. Henry Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Israeli hostages must be released. Uh, the uh, innocent Palestinians in Gaza must be supported. Uh, when uh, we... Uh, were the Foreign Affairs Committee were in the Gaza border region just a fortnight ago. We also met with Egyptian President al-Sisi. What particular support uh, can this country provide uh, to the Egyptians in terms of delivering aid and averting a humanitarian refugee crisis that is uh, potentially uh, to occur uh, if uh, the situation isn't stabilised? Well, may I first of all thank my honourable friend and all of the select committee for the work that they have done, the visits they have made, 
and the powerful arguments they have added to those of uh, the government. In, in response to his direct question, uh, I met uh, myself in Egypt with the head of the Egyptian Red Crescent. We are in very close contact and making sure that British aid and British support goes to enhance the excellent efforts which they are doing everything they possibly can themselves to prosecute. Ben Bradshaw. Uh, it, it's clear Prime Minister Netanyahu doesn't take the slightest notice yeah. of anything the British government exactly. or even yeah, 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 yeah. the Americans have been saying. Uh, in uh, mm. 1982, I think it was, Mrs Thatcher suspended arms sales to yeah. Israel. Mm. Uh, in 2002, Tony Blair did the same. What on earth would it take for yeah. this government to follow their example? Yeah. 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 Um, Mr Speaker, he, 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 he refers um, at the beginning to the views of Prime Minister Netanyahu. He will know that both the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary have engaged directly with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu to ensure that he is fully aware of what Britain thinks. And he will also be aware that uh, Israel is a pluralist democracy, the only uh, one in the uh, region. And he will be aware, for example, that uh, Israeli Minister Benny Gantz, who the Foreign Secretary recently met in London, has different views from, uh, from Prime Minister Netanyahu. So there, is, there, is, there are many different views, and Britain strongly supports uh, the views that I have set out in the House today. In terms of uh, arms sales and the arms regime, it is not for ministers from the dispatch box to uh, make policy on those things. It is for the proper due processes, as laid down and approved by Parliament, as laid down in the Lord, to be followed. And that is what we follow. Late drum. Much, Mr Speaker. Given the impending famine in Gaza outlined by the IPC report, will the UK align with the EU, EU, Sweden, Australia, Canada and many other countries by restoring funding to UNRWA as the most effective way to urgently and immediately scale up delivery of aid, food and medical supplies to Gaza? Minister. Well, I thank um, my honourable friend for her question. As she knows, we are expecting uh, the report from the Office of Internal Oversight Services in the United Nations and, indeed, the interim report from Catherine Corna, the former uh, Foreign Minister of France, uh, tomorrow. And uh, we will read it with very great uh, interest. Uh, Catherine Colonna is working together with the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Sweden, CMI in Norway, and the Danish Institute for Human Rights. And we hope that her report will show a roadmap by which uh, funding to UNRWA by Britain and by many others can be restored. But she will equally be aware that UNRWA is fully funded now for some months hence and that British funding is fully paid up until into the next financial year. Over there. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's estimated that people in northern Gaza have gone entire days and nights without heating at least 10 times in the last 30 days. Uh, Lord Cameron has said that UNRWA was the only body uh, with a distribution network in Gaza. Now, he refers to the report which is available hopefully tomorrow. Will he assure the House that the UK Government will take a decision on resuming funding as soon as possible, at least before the end of this month, which is only 12 days away? Here, here. Minister. Uh, I, I cannot give him a precise timetable, but I can answer yes to his question about it being done as soon as we think it is possible to do so. Mark Pritchard. Every life matters, whether Muslim, Christian, Jewish, or indeed other faiths, or uh, no faith. And at the centre of this crisis, a crisis, by the way, that started on the 7th of October, uh, unprovoked attack by Hamas uh, on innocent civilians. But nevertheless, at the mm. centre of this crisis, whatever people's faith or lack of faith, are children and women and men and the vulnerable suffering right now as we go off to our lunch or go off to our afternoon tea or whatever it might be yeah, yeah. and the minister will know that i have been supportive of the government and i will continue to be but i hope he will know to change in tone and that is that there's an estimate of the figures are very of course of thirty thousand civilians being killed in gaza to ten thousand roughly uh, hamas terrorists being killed if it is true that there are 10,000 other terrorists hiding in Rafah, um, 
despicably amongst the civilian uh, population, making it difficult to deliver aid. But if there are 10,000 there, are we likely to see another 30,000 civilians killed in order that uh, uh, Israel can find those terrorists? And what is the British government's position? Is, is, that, is that something he would support? Well, the, the awful symmetry which he sets out is certainly one which no one wants to see. But the point he makes so eloquently earlier in his question, uh, setting out the views and feelings which he holds, I think are widely reflected across the House, and I agree with him. Thank you. Kim Lepid. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With half the population of Gaza at risk of imminent famine, described by Melanie Ward of Medical Aid for Palestinians as meaning starvation, destitution, acute malnutrition and death. Does the Minister agree that all available aid corridors must be opened without delay and there must be an immediate ceasefire to enable food, water and urgent medical supplies to reach over a million people in desperate need? All hostages must be released and this living hell must end. Minister. Well, I agree with virtually everything she has said, but she will be aware from what I have said today and on previous occasions that calling for an immediate ceasefire is not, in the opinion of the British government, a practical proposition. And that is why we continually argue for a humanitarian pause so that we can get the hostages out and food in, followed by a sustainable ceasefire. Sir Britton. Mr Speaker, yesterday the Israeli Prime Minister vowed to press ahead with the assault on Rafah despite warnings from the international community. The prospect of millions in Rafah, only there anyway to desperately escape from conflict to the north, being subjected to further suffering is intolerable. Can the Minister update the House on what work is going on with our international partners to make clear these concerns to the Israeli Government whilst continuing to press Hamas? to release the hostages. Well, I'm, I'm grateful to her for her call for the release of the hostages. In, in, in respect of uh, the, uh, any uh, military operations in Rafa, may I draw her attention to the words of the Foreign Secretary and of the Prime Minister about the terrible dangers to, and loss of life and humanitarian consequences of that. And she, like me, uh, and everyone else, I hope, in the House, will be hoping that no such operation goes ahead. Clive Mr yeah. Speaker, I have no problem condemning Hamas, but equally I have no problem condemning the use of starvation as an act of war. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Israel has control on the ground in Gaza, enough to oversee the distribution of aid and to make sure it gets to the people who need it most. So <coughs> as the occupying force, does the government agree that Israel has a legal duty to oversee the distribution of that aid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Minister. The, the important point about the distribution of aid is it should be able to get into Gaza, preferably through road and land routes. And I set out for the House earlier the number that are getting in. Although the number is increasing, it's nothing like adequate and doesn't come anywhere near the numbers before October the 7th. And that is why the government is doing everything it possibly can to augment that figure. Steve Double. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We all want to see a ceasefire, a ceasefire that is sustainable and that holds out the prospect of a lasting peace. But the very definition of the word ceasefire means that both sides have to agree to end hostilities. So does my right of a friend agree with me that anyone calling for an immediate ceasefire needs to make absolutely clear that that must include Hamas releasing the hostages, ceasing all hostilities and committing to a future peace? Minister. Well, my, my honourable friend is, is, is correct in what he says, but the important point which I've repeatedly made in the House is that in order to have a ceasefire, you have to have agreement from those who are taking part in these, these, uh, these actions that they will abide by a ceasefire. Uh, Israel has the right of self-defence and to protect itself from the appalling acts that Hamas perpetrated on October the 7th, ever taking place again. And Hamas has made it clear that they wish to repeat those awful acts. So those do not sound to me like a very strong basis for having a ceasefire. Clive Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Three standout statements from today. Starvation is being used as a weapon of war. Israel is provoking famine. And the UK is still selling arms to Israel. When will the, Secretary of State, when will the Minister understand 
the damage and the damning nature of this that this is doing to the UK's international reputation, or rather what's left of it. Well, we've been very clear that Israel has the right of self-defence, but that they must abide by international humanitarian uh, law and the rules of war. And, And Britain is one of the leading nations in terms of finding ways to get aid into Gaza and helping our our allies and other regional powers to do everything we can to get the hostages out. So I hope that he is proud of our country's intervention in both those two respects. James Sunderland. Mr Speaker, thank you. I welcome the recent news that the UK will be sending a UK aid field hospital to Gaza. Can I please ask the Minister what assurances have been sought and what assurances have been given in respect of sufficient force protection for all of the staff there, some of whom may be British? Minister. Well, we are acutely conscious, Mr Speaker, about the way in which humanitarian workers, not just in Gaza but all around the world, unarmed put themselves in harm's way for the sake of their fellow human beings. And he is right, a field hospital provided by UK aid, uh, funding to Ahmed, arrived in Gaza from Manchester last uh, Friday. This facility is staffed by uh, UK and by local medics. They will be able to treat over 100 patients a day and we are acutely conscious of the contribution that they are making, and we do everything we can to ensure that they are protected. And in Matt Donald. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, To any reasonable and informed observer, the conduct of the war in Gaza by Israel contravenes basic international humanitarian law in failing to distinguish between armed combatants and civilians and using force beyond what is militarily necessary offence against the prohibition of inflicting unnecessary injury and is wholly disproportionate. Over 100,000 Palestinians have now been killed or injured by Israeli forces in Gaza since last October. So whilst the Minister relies on Israel being a democracy capable of abiding by its legal obligations, when the overwhelming evidence is that it is not doing so, What legal advice has he received about the complicity of and the dangers to our country of failing to take sufficient action under the relevant treaties to which this country is a signatory to deter such gross breaches of international humanitarian law? As I said, um, Mr Speaker, we do continue to assess Israel's commitment and capability to comply with international humanitarian law. Those assessments are supported by a detailed evidence base, conflict analysis, reporting from charities and NGOs, international bodies and partner countries, statements and reports by the Israeli government and their track record of compliance. And we take all of that into account in making the judgments we make. But I would point out to him that when it comes to targeting, when it comes to military action, the Israeli Defence Force has its own lawyers embedded in those uh, units and and, uh, in in much the same uh, way of prudence that the uh, British military do. Uh, That is not something which you see in any other force in the region, and it should give some confidence that they are seeking to abide by international humanitarian law. Greg Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I, in fact, welcome reports that Israel is opening new routes to directly deliver humanitarian aid into northern Gaza amidst a slowdown in UN operations and the widespread Hamas misappropriation of that aid that was referenced earlier. But significantly, at the same time that that is happening, every single day the IDF is documenting more and more Hamas infrastructure, weapons and missiles within civilian buildings, this week at Sheep Hospital and last month underneath UNRWA's own headquarters. So isn't the reality, the grim reality, that so long as Hamas remains in control of Gaza, no matter how many times people cry for a ceasefire, there can be no peace. Correct. Minister. Well, it is absolutely clear, as my honourable friend sets out, that there is no place for Hamas in any future for uh, Gaza. What happened on October the 7th is uniquely appalling. And I agree with him that until Hamas is removed from Gaza, the opportunity of peace is very limited. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The UN Special Rapporteur 
has been crystal clear that arms sales to Israel for use in Gaza are unlawful, given the clear risk that they'll be used to violate international humanitarian law. Correct. And yet the government has consistently refused to disclose whether licenses, for example, for F-35 fighter planes, have been reviewed, let alone amended. Yeah, yeah. Will he take the opportunity to finally give Parliament a straight answer? I don't want to be told that reviews are possible. We know that. I want to know if those reviews have happened. I want to know if he's going to publish the details of those reviews. And I don't want him to tell us simply that the arms regime in the UK is the toughest in the world. I know that, but that is no reassurance at all to the over one million people who are facing famine in Gaza right now. Minister. Well, she asks me whether these matters, Mr Speaker, are kept under review, and I can assure her that they are always kept under review. But equally, equally, they are not decided at the whims of ministers standing at the dispatch box. They are decided through a detailed, proper, legally governed, code governed process. And that, as always, is what the government is doing. Zara Sultan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we debate this topic, children are starving to death in Gaza. Babies are so malnourished, UNICEF says that they do not have the energy to cry. Famine isn't just imminent, it is happening according to the head of Refugees International. And this isn't a natural disaster, it isn't accidental, it is intentional. Israel is using starvation as a weapon of war to collectively punish the Palestinian people. Israel blocks food from entering Gaza while bombing the people trapped inside. So will the minister finally admit that officials have warned him that Israel is breaking international humanitarian law, or is his whole department refusing to accept the truth that Israel is committing war crime after war crime in Gaza? Well, Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Lady uses florid language to describe these matters, but I hope that she will, I hope that she will agree with me that the right thing to do is everything we possibly can to get the hostages out and support for the people she so eloquently described, support into Gaza, and that is what the government is seeking to do. And this slaughter. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Every month in Hammersmith we hold Ukrainian Open House to bring together all those supporting Ukrainian families who have fled that war. And every month I'm asked why there are not similar visa schemes mm. to allow Palestinians yeah, yeah, yeah. to join their relatives in the UK I, I or be hosted <laughs> by families who wish to give them refuge here. Yes. What's the government's answer to that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the government's answer, Mr Speaker, is that the two positions are not analogous and are very, very uh, different. But uh, he will know, uh, he, he will indeed know, that we are doing everything we can to help individual cases in both instances, and we will continue to do so. Amy Callaghan. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mr Speaker, Save the Children have reported 1.1 million people across Gaza are facing catastrophic food insecurity at the hands of Israel, with one in three children acutely malnourished. Does the Minister agree that Israel's tactic of starving the Palestinian people is a war crime? Uh -huh. As I have set out uh, several times, Mr Speaker, we are doing everything we can to make sure that the necessary food and resources get into Gaza, so that the point which, the, the point which Save the Children made in the evidence which she uh, read out is addressed, and we will continue to do precisely that. Sam Turry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Minister will know that the UK supplies approximately 15 per cent of the components using F-35 stealth bombers currently being deployed in Gaza. The very same bomber that is allegedly, in recent news, uh, being deployed from RAF Akatori in Cyprus. Now, earlier this month, Mr Speaker, a Dutch court ordered the country's government to block all exports of F-35 jets parts to Israel over concerns they have been used to violate international law during the ongoing war in Gaza. So I want to know, Mr Speaker, whether the Minister will commit today to suspending its supply of F-35 components, and will he also confirm whether RAF bases are actually being used as a launch pad for bombing in Gaza, or indeed any supportive operations, military, of the IDF and Israeli military forces? Well, I, I repeat, uh, Mr Speaker, that these are decisions that are not made at the whim of a minister standing at the dispatch box. They are made in the normal way through a proper legal and coded practice, and the government will always operate on that basis in these situations. Absolutely. Mr Speaker, Canada, Australia, Sweden, the EU have now confirmed that they will restore the funding to UNRWA. 
refuting Israel's accusation that 450 members of the agency staff had participated in the 7th October attack. With people dying from the imminent famine in Gaza, with Palestinians being killed trying to get flour to feed their families, the international community holds a degree of responsibility for failing to stop this. In light of the catastrophe situation in Gaza, will the minister commit to restarting and increasing its funding to UNRWA as a matter of urgency? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, we have already increased funding significantly, including to UNRWA. He will know that Britain uh, is not, uh, at the moment, uh, in a position of having to make that decision because we have fully funded what we said we would do and are not due to provide any further money till the end of April. But the answer to his question, I hope, will be contained in the report, both from the Office of International Oversight Services, but also from the Katyn Colonna report, which we interim report, which we are expecting tomorrow. And I know that he, like me, will read it with great care in the hope that it shows a suitable way ahead, which we can all endorse. Chris Stevens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the minister uh, try and help the House and? Uh, uh, and understanding the government's position and who the government believes is directly responsible for blocking the aid going into Gaza? And can he also tell us what the government's direct response is to the comments of the UN General Secretary, who has said that this is the highest number of people facing catastrophic hunger ever recorded by the integrated food security system anywhere and at any time? Minister. Well, regardless of the accuracy of those final comments, there is no doubt at all, as I set out in my early responses, that the IPCC report says, and I quote again, famine is a very real scenario. And that is why we are trying to do everything we can to ensure that aid gets into Gaza by every possible means. I've explained to the House the difficulties of the air option and the maritime option, but those difficulties are not stopping us from pursuing those opportunities. But at the end of the day, it is by agreement with Israel getting more trucks in, uh, by opening up uh, more points of entry, by finding other ways of bringing aid in by road. We are pursuing all of those matters, and we will continue to do so. Sarah Owen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The need for an arms embargo in Israel was laid out by the International Court of Justice in January mm. due to genocidal risk and serious harms to civilians. Since then, we've had no action from ministers. UN experts have rightly called for hostage exchange and release, but they've also warned the transfer of weapons or ammunition to Israel should cease immediately. Over 13,000 children killed, the destruction of 60% of civilian homes, and hospitals destroyed. Water and food supplies so low, Gaza is already in the midst of a catastrophic, man-made, state-made famine. Mr Speaker, the Minister boasted moments ago that the UK has an arms licensing framework with some of the toughest regulations in the world. It is plain to see for everyone that claim is in tatters. So when will the ministers finally match their words with action and hold the Israeli government to these standards and hear the calls from aid agencies, the UN and my constituents to stop arms sales to Israel and to stop the onslaught against innocent Palestinian men, women and children? Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, um, as I have repeatedly said to the House, the issue of arms sales is dealt with in a uh, legal and a coded way, and the government has no intention of varying from uh, that uh, process. Uh, it has been shown that, as I said before, it is the toughest uh, regulatory regime in the world. Uh, we continually keep it under review, but it's important that these things are done properly and in accordance with uh, the rules laid down by Parliament and laid down by the law, and we will not vary that. In, in respect to the early part of her question, I agree with her that it is essential that we are able to get more supplies into uh, Gaza. Uh, we spend all our time arguing for new ways of entry, for new opportunities to get aid in. And as I set out in the five key aims that we have, we want to see a resumption of electricity, water and telecommunication services, as well as infrastructure repair, start as soon as possible. John MacDonald. And we're all across the House, we're all desperate to see the release of the hostages. But the negotiations with regard to the release of the hostages is not aided by the treatment of Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails and detention centres. 
Yes. The Israeli newspaper Haaretz has reported yes. that 27 Palestinian detainees have died since the war was gone, who've been in Israeli custody, and some during direct questioning. They've reported beatings, abuse, torture, sexual assault, prisoners being prevented access to doctors and lawyers and refused access to medication. <coughs> um, a magistrate in Jerusalem has reported that the prisoners are detained in cages which are unfit for human beings. And now we've had the family of Marwan Barghouti, the Palestinian leader, who many place hopes in in securing peace, have been beaten by, with clubs by guards. Could I ask the minister to demand of the Israeli government now that there is access to the detention centres and prisons for humanitarian bodies to investigate these abuses and bring forward a report which will hopefully will end the abuse and assist in the negotiations for the release of the hostages? Yeah. Minister. Well, the Right Honourable Gentleman has uh, put his finger specifically on the treatment of detainees. As he will be aware, the treatment of detainees is governed by international humanitarian uh, law and indeed by the Geneva Convention. Uh, he will have seen what the Foreign Secretary has said about the treatment of detainees and Britain has consistently called for uh, both an inquiry and transparency in respect of that inquiry for any alleged abuses. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Minister has laid great weight this afternoon on the legal and coded process which governs the export of arms. But in his department now has been created a new centre, the International Humanitarian Law Compliance Assessment Process Cell. Will he now publish every assessment that that cell has made of Israel's compliance with international humanitarian law? And will he tell the House now whether the threshold has now been reached to either review or cancel any extant open general export licence for arms? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Well, the, the Right Honourable Gentleman has served at a senior level in government, and he, he knows what governments publish and what they don't publish. But what he can rest assured is that when we receive advice on international humanitarian law. Uh, we look at it uh, extremely carefully, and when the law officers make their judgments, we come to the House and update the House on this matter, and that is what we will do in due course. Christine Jardine. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Many of us in this place have been calling since November for the release of the hostages, the removal of Hamas, an immediate bilateral ceasefire, and humanitarian aid. Sometimes it seems the only thing that's changed is that the situation has got worse for the people in Gaza. My constituents write to me constantly. They feel that the Israeli government is ignoring pleas and that the people of Palestine have been abandoned. The minister said earlier that he would do whatever it took in the situation. I have every respect for the minister and I believe him when he says that. So does he accept that one of the biggest barriers to peace is, is, is illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank? Just recently, there were sanctions against four Israeli settlers who have committed human rights abuses against Palestinians. But the Liberal Democrats would hope that this is just the start. So will the UK government consider sanctioning ministers Ben Gavir and Smotrich, who promote this extremist agenda? and all of the settler movements connected to them in a way to finally make a difference to what is happening. Yeah, yeah. Can you start? Um, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, the, the Honourable Lady will be aware that Britain has consistently condemned settler violence. We've made it clear that we expect those responsible to be caught and arrested and tried um, and uh, punished for that, and we will continue to do so. As she mentioned, there are four uh, settlers specifically who have been sanctioned. We don't discuss across the House the operations of the sanctions regime, but she may rest assured that the opinion of the government is that these settlements are illegal, these acts which she described are illegal, and we will do everything we can to ensure that they stop. Holly Lynch. Thank you very much. As MPs right across this House have said this afternoon, Children in Gaza are starving. They are being starved, and we cannot tolerate it. 
If the UK's standing on the rules-based order and international humanitarian law is to be worth anything around the world, then the ICJ ruling has to be binding and there has to be consequences for failure to comply. What are the consequences? Minister? Yeah. Yeah. When, when she says that people are starving in Gaza, that's, everyone agrees that that is the case. The issue is what we can constructively do to bring about an end to the very worrying starvation figures which have been revealed uh, this week. And we are doing everything we possibly can, and we will continue uh, to do so. And I've set out at some length in the House the various different ways in which we are trying to achieve that. Uh, Andrew Gwynn. Thank you. I want to follow on from my honourable friend's question because I think it is at the heart of where we are now. Look, my constituents are heartbroken at the images that they are being sent from Gaza of children uh, dying of hunger. And they want to know why the world is largely doing nothing to help them. I believe in the rules-based system which is under enormous strain right now from a variety of different quarters. But international law matters, and we have to show leadership when it comes to the rulings of international institutions like the ICJ. Yeah. So what is Britain doing to make sure that Israel and other parties hold to the international law, the rule of law and the judgments of the ICJ? Yeah. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, he, he, he says that uh, um, his constituents are heartbroken by what is happening, and we are all of us heartbroken by what is happening. The issue is, what do we do about it? And I have set out throughout the course of the last hour a number of ways in which Britain is showing real leadership in trying to address the humanitarian situation, in trying to make sure that negotiations are successful for getting the hostages out. And we will continue to bend every sinew along with our allies to ensure that everything that can be done is done. Deirdre Brock. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, he, the Minister spoke of the detailed evidence base his government uh, re is relying on, but the world's media are prevented from reporting inside yeah. Gaza almost entirely. And if we'd seen the daily reality of life there in more detail, I suspect the international pressure on Israel would have been even stronger. But what is the UK government to ensure that, doing to ensure any deliberate targeting of journalists, particularly the Palestinian journalists, protected, of course, under international humanitarian law, is being passed on to the ICC for their investigation into war crimes? Well, as I set out, Madam Deputy Speaker, the, the uh, issue of targeting, uh, unusually in both uh, Israel, in the IDF, and indeed in the British military, is governed by legal advice. Lawyers are embedded in the people who are, with the people who are making these uh, decisions. And in respect of the uh, media, any such targeting would be absolutely outrageous. And uh, I pay tribute to the brave uh, journalists who are ensuring that accurate reporting comes back uh, from uh, Gaza and from the Middle East. Khalid Mahmoud. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I want to make clear that Hamas have opposed since 2007. I deplore the action taken on the 7th of October. I totally believe the hostages on both sides must be released. But I agree with him in terms of the Israeli blockade that is leading to famine, that is leading to death and displacement, young children dying of malnutrition and hunger. He says continuously that the two sides want it done together. Why doesn't it then put a Security Council resolution to the United Nations, making sure that something is done about it on an international level and put in a key peacekeeping force to deal with this issue and allow the people to continue normal lives? Well, I think, I think the House will understand, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the issue of a, a policing force inside Gaza is, uh, is premature. Uh, and I thank him for his uh, comments uh, about uh, Hamas uh, and for what he has said about deploring all the things that Hamas uh, have done, and I agree with him about that. He sets out the scale of humanitarian need, and 
throughout all of the statement, I've been setting out how Britain, along with our allies, is seeking to help move the dial to get more aid and support into Gaza and get the hostages out. In terms of the United Nations Security Council and its resolutions, he will know that Britain is one of the leading architects of those resolutions in our role as one of the permanent five in uh, New York. And I can tell him uh, that that effort, and I pay tribute uh, to uh, Barbara Woodward, uh, the permanent representative of Britain at the United Nations, they are working ceaselessly in the British mission at the UN to try and make sure that there is agreement on resolutions which can help bring an end to this. Chris Law. Madam Deputy Speaker, the famine unfolding is entirely man-made and is being used as a weapon of war by Israel a war crime and those that continue to support this collective punishment and deny aid are complicit in this unfolding tragedy. Last week, Yanez Lenarsik, the head of humanitarian aid and crisis management at the European Commission, said that neither he nor any other UNRWA donor had been presented with any evidence by Israel of UNRWA involvement in the 7th of October attacks. Indeed, our own committee, when it visited northern uh, Egypt just recently, spoke to the head UNRWA. They also had no evidence. So, very simple question. Has the Minister been presented with any evidence to support his decision to pause the UK's life or death funding to UNRWA? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Minister? Madam Deputy Speaker, he will have seen the evidence that has been put before the international community. He will know that it was sufficiently strong for he will know that it was sufficiently strong for the head of UNRWA immediately to act against some of his officials. But on uh, all these matters, uh, tomorrow we will hear the interim report from Catherine Colonna, the uh, former uh, French uh, foreign minister, and we look forward to studying that report in the hope that it will take matters uh, forward when we have a chance to read it. Uh, Stella Creasy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Secretary of State will be aware that thousands across Israel have protested opposing yeah. the approach that President Netanyahu is taking, including the hostage families. They know the situation in Gaza will not help release their family members. That people in Israel see what is happening to the Palestinians. They hear the words today of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, who has said that what is happening and Israel continuing restrictions on aid could amount to the use of starvation as a method of war. He is explicit about that and the concerns that it raises. I understand the Minister telling us that he doesn't want to make policy from the dispatch box. Will he tell us whether he has sought explicit legal advice on this question about whether Israel is now committing a war crime in the use of starvation? Yes or no? So the, the issue of legal advice, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, is one that we are always in receipt of and we act upon it. And uh, when we receive it, we take the necessary steps as she would expect. In the first part of her question, she set out a point that I was making earlier, that Israel, uh, more eloquently than me, but that Israel is a pluralist democracy. There are different views. And I tweeted last weekend the extraordinary moving work being done by two people who had come together from opposite sides, whose families had suffered so grievously in the aftermath of October the 7th. It is that pluralist democracy which gives us the chance that accountability will be properly followed in Israel, which, as I say, is the only uh, pluralist democracy that we see in that part of the world. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The IPC report published today shows that one in three children under two years old in the north of Gaza are now acutely malnourished. This figure was one in six in February. Uh, this month, people of Muslim faith across the world will be observing Ramadan. Uh, the situation is, is, is dire and urgent in, in Gaza. So will the government, uh, will the minister call for an immediate ceasefire to ensure that no civilian goes hungry, malnourished or without medical support in Gaza? Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, he and I both share absolutely the desire that people should not go hungry in Gaza. And that is why the government, along with our allies, is working so hard to get uh, more food uh, in. And we will continue to do everything we possibly can to make sure that the suffering, uh, which has been so eloquently set out on all sides of this house, uh, is brought to an end as soon as possible. 
Alison Fairless. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Does the deliberate starvation of a civilian population constitute a war crime? Yes or no? There would be, I think, a uh, very serious doubt about the term deliberate uh, starvation, the deliberate starvation. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm unable to give her a yes or no answer to her question. Dame Diana Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. We all know that behind Hamas sits the malign power of Iran and the IRGC. The same with Hezbollah and also with the Houthis. So, with the Foreign Secretary now having been in post for five months, can the Minister update the House on the progress of actually prescribing the IRGC? Well, as, as she will know, Madam Deputy Speaker, the, the issue of prescription is not one which we discuss across the floor of the House, but the arguments for and against are kept under very close review uh, by the Government and will continue to be kept under that review. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. To deal with the worsening grave humanitarian crisis for the sake of the dying children and innocent civilians, as Palestinians desperately try to survive and observe the holy month of Ramadan, it is imperative that both sides agree to an immediate ceasefire, which is what I recently voted for in Parliament. Aid in huge quantities is critical, and any attempts by the Israeli government to block it must be condemned. So, Minister, what is the UK government doing to achieve an immediate ceasefire, get hostages released, and put pressure on the Israeli government to allow unimpeded aid into Gaza? Well, he will have seen the words of the Prime Minister and of the Foreign Secretary about the absolute imperative of getting more aid and humanitarian supplies uh, into uh, Gaza. And uh, what he says about an immediate ceasefire, I've um, answered that point on a number of occasions uh, during the last uh, hour and a quarter. Uh, as he knows, in order to get a ceasefire, both sides in this terrible conflict need to agree for a ceasefire. And there is absolutely no indication whatsoever that Hamas have any intention of a ceasefire. Indeed, they have made absolutely clear that they wish to perpetrate once again the terrible events that took place on October the 7th. Uh, Andrew Bridgen. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Hamas's cold-blooded murder of at least 1,300 Israeli civilians on the 7th of October was truly abhorrent. But now, sadly, those horrific numbers are dwarfed by the number of innocents of all faiths who have had their lives taken away from them in Gaza. I welcome the fact that the government is moving on this position, but I believe it is going to have to move further and faster to pre prevent a catastrophe and further loss of innocent lives. The Minister has stated that the International Court of Justice ruling is binding. Will he inform the House how that ruling can be enforced? Well, the, the point he makes about the government uh, moving on its policy is, is, uh, is not true. Basically, the government has made it clear throughout that we will do everything we possibly can to achieve a pause so that we can help get the hostages out and food and support into uh, Gaza. And we are continuing to do everything we can, night and day, to reach that conclusion. Ms. Morden. Thanks, Madam Deputy Speaker. The head of the UN, Antonio Guterres, and the head of the EU policy, Joseph Borrell, and multiple accounts on the BBC have all indicated famine is underway. The Secretary has repeatedly said this afternoon he's moving the dial, the government are doing everything they can. Can he explain in very practical terms so that constituents would like to understand how he's doing absolutely everything he can, how he's showing leadership to ensure that all routes are open by Israel, to ensure that we avoid further human catastrophe. Well, I've set out um, for the House the work that we are doing both in respect of the maritime corridor, in respect of supporting uh, food and medical supplies being delivered uh, from the air. But at the end of the day, those are inevitably going to be relatively small amounts, particularly from the air. And the answer is to try and open up more access points into Gaza by road and make sure that trucks flow more easily through those access points. And the British government has been doing everything it possibly can with our allies to ensure that we take that agenda forward, and we will continue to do so. I set out the, uh, a number of tonnes of aid which arrived in Gaza on the 13th of March. I mentioned the very large number of family tents, blankets, shelter kits, 
kits, shelter fixing kits, sleeping mats, and dignity kits that went in. But that is on top of the enormous amount of aid we've provided uh, previously to UNRWA, but also to UNICEF and to the Egyptian Red Cross and to other NGOs and charities and medical organisations that are doing everything they can to try and alleviate the suffering in Gaza. Mora. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I am absolutely clear that the hostages must be released. I am also absolutely clear that the situation in Gaza has gone from dire to horrendous to cataclysmic and my constituents do not understand why it is being allowed to continue. The majority leader in the US Senate has identified Netanyahu's ultra-right wing um, government as a barrier to peace. The European Union foreign policy chief said that Israel, one of the richest and most military powerful nations in the world, is provoking famine. So will he say clearly uh, that it is unacceptable for Israel to prevent aid to enter Gaza? And will he also say clearly what he is actually doing about it, what demands he is making of Israel, what consequences he is setting out to Israel for its actions beyond wringing his hands? Well, she will, have, she will have... I thank her, first of all, for her clarity on the issue of the hostages. Um, uh, she asks why uh, all of this is being allowed to continue. I point out to her, as I have consistently this afternoon, that the government, uh, along with our allies, is doing everything we possibly can to stop it uh, continuing. And uh, she, asks, she asks me about what else we can do to try and ensure that it uh, doesn't continue, and I point to her to uh, the comments I made in my response to the urgent question from the Shadow Foreign Secretary about all the different ways in which Britain, along with our allies, is seeking to alleviate the suffering that is taking place in Gaza. Alan Brown. Madam Deputy Speaker, children in Gaza are dying at the fastest rate the world has ever seen, according to IPC yeah. report. Instead of calling out Israel for their culpability, the government still refuses to sign UN resolutions. They still sell arms to Israel. Yep. Instead, their great wheeze is to try and find ways to bypass Israeli blockade by doing uh, aid by air or aid by sea, which isn't clearly going to get enough aid in. Yep. Now, the government's not going to admit how absurd their position is, but it will answer di directly. Has the government received legal advice that Israel hindering aid getting into Gaza but, uh, <coughs> violates international law. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the government fair. keeps its legal advice under review at all times. The current uh, legal advice is that Israel has both the capacity and the will to abide by international humanitarian law. And if that position changes as a result of the advice of the government lawyers, then of course we will make that clear to the, uh, to the House. <coughs> Debbie Abrahams. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. We've heard this morning uh, in, in terms of how half the population in Gaza, the first time in modern history that such a large population is, is being subject to, to famine. We've also heard about the absolute imperative that we as a country, but also our allies, obey and abide by international law. Given this, and what the minister has said, that he is doing all that he can, his government is doing all that he can. Can I ask you, on behalf of everybody here, my constituents most important, because they don't understand what exactly that is, and an apologising for being so blunt, why does this seem to be so ineffective? <laughs> Minister? Uh, well, in, in respect of the first point she makes, everyone must abide by international uh, humanitarian law, and Britain is doing everything it can to ensure that the rules of war and international humanitarian law are respected. Uh, she asks why our efforts are so ineffective. Um, I, I would argue with uh, her wording, but this is not a situation which Britain is tackling alone. 
all of us, the Americans, the European Union, across the region, all of us are doing our very best to ameliorate the suffering that is going on in Gaza. It is a collective effort, and uh, Britain will not be found wanting in continuing to exert all the pressure we can, along with our allies, to ensure that this situation is brought to a conclusion. Emma Hardy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The horrific famine in Gaza is made even worse by the fact we know that it's man-made, and there is no agency better than UNWA at delivering the small amount of aid that there currently is. I've listened to the Minister's response, and I've heard him tell me there's a report due out tomorrow, and I've heard him tell <clears throat> me as well that funding from the UK Government remains until the end of April, but the end of April is 43 days yeah. away. So how will the Minister ensure that there is no break in funding for UNWA and that is urgently resume the funding so they can deliver what little aid there is to the people who so desperately need it. Yeah. Well, the Honourable Lady is right that uh, UNRWA has the logistics hubs, the warehouses, uh, the vehicles, the infrastructure, which is essential for the delivery of aid in uh, Gaza, and everyone uh, understands that. She asks me whether I can guarantee that we will be able to resume uh, funding uh, at the end of April. I very much hope that will be the case. It will be very much dependent on the report uh, tomorrow from the former French Foreign Minister and indeed from the United Nations. We are doing everything we can to advance the case, uh, to make sure that we can resume funding when it is uh, possible. And I will update the House in due course uh, on the results of those reports and on the judgment that the British Government makes at that point. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. This week, Prime Minister Netanyahu confirmed with his Cabinet that he plans to proceed with, to operate in Rafah, an assault that we know will end up in the killing of many civilians, including children, and will, of course, impede aid flow into Rafah, which is the main um, place where aid can now <coughs> enter Gaza. As a result of that, the consequences <coughs> will be catastrophic. So how is he using the ICJ and sanctions in order to stop further assault in Gaza, not least in the light of his comments that no international pressure will stop Israel, comments from the Prime Minister of Israel. Well, what I would say to the Honourable Lady, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that in respect of military operations in Rafah, she will have heard what the Prime Minister has said, the advice that he has given to Prime Minister Netanyahu. She will have heard what the Foreign Secretary has said uh, very clearly indeed. She will have heard what the European Union has said, indeed what uh, President Biden has said. And we very much hope that the Israeli government, Prime Minister Netanyahu, will heed these words, which come not from enemies of Israel, but from friends of Israel. Uh, Matt Weston. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, one million people face the imminent prospect of famine. Matthew Hollingworth, the county, country director for the United Nations World Food Programme, uh, confirmed that the situation would be reversible. In fact, in January, uh, the Foreign Secretary, his boss, uh, actually uh, confirmed that Israel has a legal obligation as occupying power to provide food and water to the Gazans. Uh, so does the Minister agree that the Israeli government must allow the full reopening of land bridges into uh, Gaza? They should recommence the issue of new visas for humanitarian uh, workers. And finally, will he confirm, is his government in lockstep with Chuck Schumer and President Biden or Prime Minister Netanyahu? Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, we are working incredibly closely at all levels with the American administration. He asked me about new visas. We have consistently urged the Israeli government to grant the UN visas and indeed the renewal of visas as swiftly as possible. He is quite right about the famine, the effects of uh, uh, famine. Uh, being reversible, and that is why Britain is seeking to ensure that aid in much greater amounts gets in both by road, sea, and air uh, in every way we possibly can. Paul Valka. Thank you, 
Madam Deputy Speaker. Famine in Gaza is imminent and the death toll is rising. Like many, including the United Nations Human Rights Office, I cannot help but be concerned that continued restriction of aid and therefore starvation is being used by the Israeli government. The holy month of Ramadan risks turning into a further tragedy for millions of Palestinians facing hunger and disease. Stern words just aren't cutting it with Netanyahu. So what will it take for the government to go further and stop the exportation and sales of weapons to the Israeli government. And I respect the minister as his place saying he can't make up um, policy on the hoof of the dispatch box. But when will the minister be able to stand at the dispatch box and tell this house answers to the serious questions on arms sales, unimpeded aid, restoration of unrefunding and potential sanctions? Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I think on all those matters I have been very clear to the House, both about where the government stands and the direction of uh, travel. And the underlying points which she makes are the reason why we are arguing with such uh, force and passion for a humanitarian pause so that we can get resources into Gaza and get the hostages out, and that such a pause could lead to a sustainable ceasefire. And that is what the government will continue to do. James Murray. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. We urgently need an immediate humanitarian ceasefire, a massive surge of aid, all hostages to be released, and we need a lasting peace with a two-state solution. I recently met with Medical Aid for Palestinians to discuss the desperate and unbearable humanitarian crisis in Gaza. So can the Minister explain the details of what the UK Government is doing to press both for the necessary food and medical aid to get into Gaza, but also critically for it to be distributed rapidly within Gaza? Minister. Well, he, he is right about the logistical difficulties of his final point, and we are working uh, with all the resources we can to make sure that the aid is able to be delivered and isn't either siphoned off, pilfered, or, or indeed attacked by people who are very short of food and are desperate to get it. He, he sets out the importance of a humanitarian uh, pause, the hostages release, and a new a vision, a new political vision uh, of the future for uh, Palestine. Uh, and uh, those uh, three things are very much at the heart of what the British government is seeking to achieve. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I first of all thank the Minister very much for his answers to the questions and for the Minister's uh, uh, focus to find a lasting ceasefire and peace, because that's what we all want. Everyone in this House wants to see that happening. W will the Minister further outline what aid and assistance have uh, been provided for those in the area of Gaza that has the capability or the capacity of arable land use to allow them to attempt to grow food? Uh, etc. for community use and is there more that we can do in this place to provide self-sustaining aid? Well, I thank Stop. my honourable friend for his uh, question. Um, the, the issue of arable land use uh, inevitably takes a bit of a back seat at the moment because of the uh, difficulty of growing uh, crops in uh, Gaza. But as part of a settlement and the building towards a two-state solution, that would definitely be part of the reconstruction. Um, and uh, I accept very much the wisdom of what he says on these matters. And I'm sure it is something, when, it come, when we reach that stage, that uh, will be addressed. And I point out to him, as I've mentioned to the House uh, before, that if you look at the progress that was made at Oslo, it was on the back of appalling events in the Second Intifada. And we must hope that in spite of the desperate events that have taken place, uh, we are able to lift people's eyes to the political possibilities of a two-state solution with both Palestine and Israel living in peace behind uh, secure borders. Uh, that is the central aim when the moment comes of the British government and a great deal of work and planning is going into what that sort of initiative would look like. Olivia Blake. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Over one million people, one million people in northern Gaza are on the verge of famine. 
with aid groups now issuing dire warnings of catastrophic levels of hunger and man-made starvation. Just last week, the UN reported that humanitarian aid is being denied or postponed by Israeli authorities. We are not powerless. This government can and should take action. So what else can the government be doing to lobby the Israeli government to allow more aid to enter Gaza as a matter of urgency? And do ministers agree that we need a ceasefire now, and that is the best way to get the release of hostages? Well, I, I set out to the House and for the Honourable Lady the issues around a ceasefire and why it is the view of the government and many others that uh, a pause for humanitarian purposes could lead to a sustainable ceasefire. And I think that is the sensible uh, way to proceed. She asks what more the British government and others could be doing. I submit that Britain is doing everything it possibly can to achieve aims that are commonly held across this House of bringing an end to the uh, situation in Gaza, of getting the hostages home, getting aid and support into Gaza. And I can reassure her, and indeed the House, that we will continue to do everything we can, uh, night and day, until we reach those objectives. Point of order.